So hello, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is uh, Wolfram Müller, and uh, yes, I, I am really happy to stand here right now in front of you, and I'm glad that so many people found the way here to the presentation. Um, I think that's a sign that this agile stuff uh, and improving agile and even improving critical chain is is of some kind of interest. Um, one question for me, just to have a, a feeling. Um, who knows about agile methodologies and who worked with agile? Just hands up. Oh, that's pretty good. I expected less, but it's more, uh, something around 30% here in the room already know about this. Um, I just want to start with a short introduction out of my perspective what means Agile? And if I'm asked to explain Agile, I just say, oh, guy, let the people work. That is Agile. Um, and to let people work, it's very interesting to have a goal to work for, an idea, a business value, a customer, a product, something fancy and cool. And then you can take a team put a team in a room, give them some computers or whatever they need, and then let them organize themselves. And if they have a goal, uh, if they are rational people, normal people, they will find a way to organize themselves. And that's agile. OK, yeah, that's agile. We have heard that before, I think. Um, it's called teamwork or something like that. Yeah. Um, but agile is more. If you look detailed in Agile, Agile is work in progress control at the best. Um, they have rigid rules to control work in progress. Uh, the second generation of Agile even called Kanban. Kanban is work in progress control. So um, they mixed good ideas from teamwork with work in progress control. And I, I think you know something about work in progress control. We are talking the whole day about that. And they eliminated negative multitasking. And if you put both together, it will be a success. And that's agile. It's a big success story all over the world. They started with software development, then with project management, um, education, whatever. I think if you Google and Google for agile toothbrushing, you will find some uh, things too. So everybody but is doing Agile, um, and it's good. Success story after success story. So um, you have to know something about me. I'm a classical project manager. I led a project office. Um, I was responsible for over 500 projects, 140 in parallel, not alone, with 40 project managers behind. Therefore, I do project management. I am a project manager, and, and I did often critical chain. So uh, two years ago, I started to look at this Agile stuff, because everybody uh, is doing that. And um, I found a lot of problems. It is not compatible with project management at all. So I had uh, negative effects. But on the other side, I want to use it. And with all the TUC knowledge uh, I, I'm trained on, uh, I knew that there must be a solution, of course. So I gave a little of the knowledge to my team. And we together found some ways to solve this, to improve Agile and make it compatible to projects, we found somehow the missing third layer of critical chain. The third layer of critical chain. You ever heard of that? Well, perfect not. Um, I will present it here. Um, we found the missing link. Uh, we now can integrate Agile with critical chain seamless. And then you get something new. It's, it's more Agile, more uh, efficient at all, and, and makes fun and all the stuff. And I call it sometimes Agile Enterprise. So that's the foreword. I just want to dig into the presentation. What's about this layers? Um, if you look on a project organization from outside, it looks pretty like there are some ideas. A lot of them, hopefully. Then you have a factory for projects. And on the other side, some products, features, or whatever falls out of the machine or of the company. If you have a situation like this, you know it already. There must be somewhere a constraint, a resource constraint, or a virtual constraint, or whatever. Um, that's here. And of course, 
it's a production, so just do staggering or drum buffer rope or whatever, just to keep the work in progress under control in the constraint, keep it at 80% normally, and that's it. Then you find the starting and the end dates. Perfect, that's layer one. Okay? Uh, if you have a layer one, then you need a layer two, and the layer two has to have a different characteristic. Okay? A uh, layer two is easy, just select one project. And the project has a different characteristic. Um, it's looked like this. That is the generic project plan of every project I've ever seen. You have something here in, in the front. It's uh, conceptual work, planning work, and all the stuff, deciding what to deliver. Then you have, here you know what to do. And then you have different chains, long chains, short chains. You have an integration point here. And afterwards, you have to integrate and buffer, and you have the project end. What's interesting, in the project world, you don't know exactly how long the, the work packages are, are taking. You have variations, you have dependencies, and therefore, you use this buffer to get reliability. So that is called critical chain, I suppose. Um, you have a critical chain. That's layer two, dependencies and variations. So, and I, I, I told about a layer three. So there must be, if you have two layers, then there must be a layer three. And the layer three, it's very often the longest chain. And it looks like this. It's a sub-project. And the sub-projects, um, they have a different characteristics, again. And the Agile guys, they found a trick to exploit and, and, and manage this perfectly. Um, a sub-project normally looks like this. You have a backlog of tasks or stories, better say stories, some things, some features, some, some functionality, uh, some business value. And on the other hand, in between you have a process or something like that. And in, uh, in the other side you have tasks, finished tasks that you want to deliver. And that is a missing link. How to manage this process as fast as, 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 as efficient as possible. Okay, perhaps this could be production again. Uh, on the first level, production. Second level, projects, production. Perhaps. So, what, what do uh, the Agile guys do? Um, they have the backlog on the one side. They have the finished task on the other side. And their main interest is not in the team stuff. They always tell you this team stuff is the most important stuff. But the work in progress stuff is the most important one. Um, it's always like this. That's, that is Scrum. I, I show you Scrum. They just define some uh, time frames uh, where they can, what they can handle, where they can have an overview. And uh, this is typically two to four weeks. It's called sprints. And the team, after a while, knows how much of this backlog bubbles they can take. So it's a pull system. The team is allowed to pull as many uh, as they want. They pull it in their sprints. And they are just working, concentrated without any disruptions. They have flow. They deliver. And then it's, it's here. It's finished. Perfect. That is the easiest, the most lightweight steering of a process that I can imagine. And it works pretty good. They are fast, agile, flexible, happy, more happy, even more happy. They really like it. But, oh, there's one thing I, I forgot to mention. They are far more successful than we. If you look in Wikipedia, and watch how many people in the world searching for Scrum, it's 70, uh, 37 times more than critical change. So they are really successful. OK. Um, but I told I am project manager, and I have to deliver in time. I have to deliver projects. So I have typically one problem. Um, this pile of work to be done, it's open in Agile. The stakeholder can put new, new bubbles in and take bubbles out and reprioritize bubbles. So it's a floating, a floating whip. Then, mm, if you ask them, 
if some story is really, uh, what is the due date for a story, then they say, oh, hmm, guy, um, we are working as fast as possible, but we don't know exactly when it's done. Uh, but, but I can promise you it's done when it's done. Ah, fine. Um, then I go into uh, my uh, project management tool and enter it's done when it's done, and the tool says error. Okay. Um, there are some hidden buffers, too. That's very interesting. They don't believe me, the Agile guys. They are hidden buffers. If you have group dynamics, it's always like this. The first three sprints, they are very enthusiastic. They, they, have, they, have, they are relieved out of their work in progress, and they, they are self-organized, and they do over hours and all the stuff around that. And um, after the third or the fourth sprints, the problem starts. Huh? The group dynamics kicks in, and then they fail some of the stories they promised to do. And afterwards, the stakeholder came to review, and they don't have to talk anything. Uh, they just say, so, and the people feel awkward because they have not delivered what they have promised. And what's the reaction of the team? Next time they pull a little less. Uh, that's buffering. They are buffering. Or they, they reduce the velocity or they increase the story points per story. No problem. Uh, you don't see it. It's Parkinson law. So, um, no one believes me, but in Agile there are reserves. Um, and if you ask for remaining duration, they just say, oh, shit. So it's incompatible with projects and CCPM. But there's, that's one undesired effect. There's another one. Um, if you look at Scrum with these batches, oh, no, sprints, they call it sprints, but it, they are batches. Um, so batches, you know, inventory, more inventory than necessary. If you go to Kanban, they often have very, very, very big Kanban boards with many steps and buffers before, and some blocked buffers and all the stuff around. So normally Kanban boards are full of inventory, and therefore they are slow. If you really look at task level, agile methods are slow. Too slow for me, by the way. Um, I'm standing for speed for projects, not for slow for projects. So um, that is a problem, and now we have to solve it. And for the left side, you already know the problem that's, that's, uh, the, 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 that was easy to solve. If you want to have reliable delivery, you need this fever curve. The best possible way to feedback the progress to the team, and that works perfect. If you want to draw this, you have to measure something. You have to measure the progress and the buffer consumption. So. You just measure longest critical chain complete and buffer consumption. Uh, how do you do this? You have this backlog in the beginning, and we do all the, the Scrum stuff with relative uh, story point estimations, uh, uh, speed grooming, and all the stuff around that. So after a session with the team, you have all the stories needed for a release. You, you have the story points. Don't take too much time for it. Because uh, in the end, the mean story point per story is 10. You can check it in your team. By the way, if you divide all the story points by the number of stories, you will come to 10. That's my uh, thing. So you can skip this estimation stuff completely. Just say 10 and good. And they don't believe me. I just write it normally on a paper and put it in a, in a, in a sheet. And afterwards, I show them what they have estimated. And it, it fits perfectly well. So uh, you have a, a backlog in the beginning. You, have don't, you don't have any wish features or something like that. It's just must features. And after each week or sprint or whatever, um, moon cycle, uh, you can look what's in the backlog. And then you can have an estimation. You can't calculate out of this how it's going on in future. That's not possible, by the way. Uh, the, the, the team can get ill or something coming to or, or whatever. You don't know how you proceed. So it's every time you do this, you do some estimation, a forecast, looking into the bowl, but you don't know exactly. So that's it. And if you have an estimated time to completion, that's here. Then you are here. That's now. Then you know how many time um, is spent. If you have designed a buffer, 30%, 20%, whatever, that's the estimated time to completion. And you have the buffer consumption. It's all estimation. That's no problem with that. So the most interesting point in this is the due date. What is the due date I promised to my customers? 
how to get this. And if you say, oh, I just estimated the due date and it's something around blah, 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 then the stakeholder will say, oh, go away. Huh? Explain me why. So, but that's easy to explain. Um, that is a probability curve of a project, the, the absolute probability of success of a project. I didn't draw it very well, I draw it by hand, but there's always one time in the future um, if you select the due date before this, you have no chance at all. That is, by the way, the optimistic uh, due date. Uh, and some, t some date in the future that is a 100%, the pessimistic one, that is something around here, um, or here, or here. I don't, it's not so exactly to see, because you don't know what, else, what all happens. Um, it's far away in the future, and after that, you have no gain in, in success anymore. So um, what to choose, and I explain it afterwards, normally you choose the tipping point. So you have everything. You have a backlog story points, you have clarified the project order, by the way, in this case. You have a burn down, that's nothing new for the guys. You have a buffer, you have a due date, you can draw the, the picture and everything's fine. How to get to this S-curve? That's, it's called, this uh, speech is called uh, new knowledge. And that's a, a little trick we used here. Um, if, you have, if you start to think in probabilities, you see that the backlog is a probability curve. The current, at the moment you are doing the grooming, you have an optimistic value. I've never seen that it's, got, uh, it's getting less. That's Parkinson, by the way, too. But I know that all the teams can say, oh, something around 20% I would get. Again, I, I, I will find some stories under the way. Or sometimes uh, the stakeholder just says, okay, I don't know exactly everything what I want. Um, I give you 20% more, huh? but therefore I want ag agility, flexibility. That you can deal with the stakeholders. So you have a probability curve, that's a relative probability curve, that is optimistic is defined that uh, pretty unreliable, um, realist, realistic, pessimistic backlog. So we have a curve with three points. You have the same curve for the velocity for your throughput. The same curve. Normally you know something about your productivity right now in story points per week. That's a realistic one, but sometimes uh, people get ill. Sometimes, and I see it very often, they perform a lot better than expected. If they have a buffer and so, uh, then they release all their internal buffers and they get more speed. So sometimes you have an optimistic value. And now it's very easy. We want to calculate the S-curve. Um, if you divide the pessimistic backlog by the de pessimistic velocity, you get this latest possible finishing of the work package. If you divide optimistic, um, by optimistic value, you get the first possible. I don't want to choose that, but that's mathematically correct. It might happen with a probability of zero that you reach this due date. Um, so you have the endpoints and the convulsion operator. There's especially a co uh, operator for, for, for this uh, working with these curves. Convulsion, it's named. Then you get all the points in between. I have an Excel, I can provide it to you, that calculates everything. So, and if you do an integration on that, you will get the S-curve. This area is danger area. Every small thing that happens uh, throws away your due date uh, by a magnitude. This is an interesting way. With each day uh, more time, you get a huge gain in, in uh, security, and this is just too expensive. So it's a good idea to choose this tipping point. And of course, uh, no estimation is ever right. You can choose whatever you want somewhere in this region, but you can stay with 80%. And uh, if you do that with teams, and that's not academic here anymore, that's used in, in companies right now, um, normally they get a probability here, 3%. Uh, and then they say, oh, we have to go to the board members. We have to say the project is not possible. And I say, oh, go, go, stop, guys. Huh? They can't, uh, board members can't work with possibilities. Um, just do it the other way around. Just cut the backlog until you are here in the probability. 
then you can say to the board members, oh, guys, we, we calculated, we used this TUC stuff, and all the, the guys, uh, they told us how to do it. And that is what we can promise. Then they will say, oh, that's not enough to sell. We need an additional feature or something like that. Then you say, okay, we put that in in the backlog. It's just Excel. Huh? You can just uh, mark it as, uh, yes, we want it. <laughs> then you calculate a new due date. And then you dis discuss on the fly with the stakeholder what they will get at what time. And that is very, very valuable for the team, for the stakeholder, and for the whole company. So that is the first part that is called reliable Scrum. Um, just to show you an example. Um, well, where is it? That was normal Scrum. Here we introduced reliable Scrum. That turn into green was releasing all the internal buffers. They hidden. They have hidden for oh, for the long time to protect themselves. At this point, we just reduced the project length by elf, uh, 11 percent. And therefore, if you reduce 11 percent of the project, you shorten the buffer too. And therefore, um, this is the buffer consumption is going up very fast. But we delivered in time, in scope, in budget, and we even uh, decreased the duration of 11%. I see this curve here in almost all introductions, because they have hidden all buffers, because I am called in bad running scrum teams. And bad running scrum teams mean um, they, they are already hurt and they already buffer. So that is reliable scrum. And the, the new knowledge is how to deal with the, the reliability curves and get something in hand how to talk with a stakeholder on a, on a scientific base. It's not right, never, but it's scientific. So, um, so that's it. So you have all the agility stuff and um, the reliability. First of the undesired effects solved. But agile looks like a production line. And I already told Ford generation one, uh, Kanban generation two, and we all know the run buffer rope is better. So you have somewhere a stage, a constraint stage, so you can use run buffer rope. And how does it look like in reality? You have the backlog of stories. Sorry, it's a backlog of stories that are bigger things. And the developers, the, the, the ones who are doing the work, they are not interested in the story. It's good to know what they're producing. But in the end, they are interested in tasks. So uh, if you build up a drum buffer rope, you have to know where is the constraint. And the constraint in our society is the developer, the one who is creative, the one who is developing, the one who is doing this stuff. So um, it normally looks like this, the process. You have here the stories then someone has to break the stories apart to tasks, small tasks for our tasks, and then the developer comes, and there here come some testers and reviewers who make sure that the quality is one. So that is, I, I already showed it, um, that is a process, that is development, that is a drum, that is a constraint. So you have to make sure that the constraint is never running dry. So you have a buffer before that, a task buffer, and you have a threshold, how many tasks have to be in there. And if, if the threshold is, uh, the, the, the content of the buffer is too low and reaches the threshold, then a new story is started. The, a very, very simple way of uh, managing that. But inside this, there's also a small drum buffer rope contained. And it took a while for me to recognize that, but that's very important. That's the next, next inside. Um, here, it's a drum, and in the drum, there are buffers too. If you look at Kanban boards especially, they have often blocked tasks. And these blocked tasks are inventory. Or, or they start with two tasks, because they are so smart to have uh, much, much tasks open. You can always shift a little, and you're happy with that. So very often, there is some inventory hidden. So it's some kind of a drum buffer rope too. And we have just one single rule in our teams. That is less open tasks than developer. 
then you have one piece flow, one developer, one task, and I even reduce it once more. We are doing, uh, we are doing pair reviewing, that means someone is developing, and 20% of the time overall is reviewing. After I have finished, I go to another colleague and we are looking over the code, and 20% of the time is review time. Therefore, if you have 10 developers, uh, you have eight tasks open. And the, the only thing you have to do to look whether you are fast and have removed all the impediments and all the stuff around that, you just have to ask a team how many open tasks and how many developer, and if the first number is bigger than the last one, then you knew you have to do something. And it's very easy what you have to do, you just have to stop opening new tasks. In that moment, I just say, no open tasks anymore, huh? and if you can't work, Again, uh, anymore, then just come to me and we solve your problem. And uh, interestingly, they don't have work anymore, these developers right now at this moment, so I always have someone who has time to solve the problem. And they talk at the coffee machine and in, within days they learned that's a good idea to solve problems immediately and forever and you automatically can come to continuous development. And the, the stand-up meetings and everything is getting very, very, very lightweight, because you don't have much uh, open work. Um, a continuous flow diagram helps to monitor that. Um, that's a good idea. And the incentive of the team is to keep the amount of open task lower than the developers. That's very easy to understand. And what they gain is flow, 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 flow. And it's very, very uh, motivating for teams if they just can work and, and every day one or two tasks are finished and no blockers and no stuff anymore. That's very, very exciting. So that's accumulated uh, inflow, outflow. And on the backlog side, you already have the reliable Scrum fever curve. And that's all what you need um, to uh, steer an uh, agile team. Uh, that's an example of another project. Uh, that's uh, the hello awake uh, curve. I don't know why we started at 60% there. That was a bad idea, by the way. Never do that again. But in the end, uh, it developed you know, more like this, more on the red-yellow zone. Uh, you can discope even in Agile. No problem with that. So that's one of the goals. That is a continuous flow diagram. You see here, we had just a few work packages open, and they are immediately done. Um, that was uh, my nightmare. I, I, I don't know why we, we opened too much tasks. And immediately, it doubled the lead time, or the cycle time. So easy. And the third thing is, if you really improve the skills, the craftsmanship of the team, the curve will go up. Or if you have systematic problems, with this team, we, 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 we came into the area of legacy, and at the moment, we just saw that, the, that it goes down. But that's all you need to steer an agile team. And now, it's very easy. On the first level, you have production steering. On the second level, you have the dependencies, variations. You have project management, critical chain, by the way, and you can use here for or here for or in this phase or in this phase. Don't care when it's appropriate, when you have a production environment with a lot of small things to do that can be tests, can be features, can be scrum, can be whatever, huh? then you can burn down. Even turning on light bulbs in, in, in a house or everything like that or, or, or boats, uh, cleaning up boats, you can do like this. Every time you have the situation that you have similar things to burn down, then you can use that. That is called reliable Scrum and ultimate Scrum. Um, and it's completely compatible with project management. We use it in, in a company right now. Um, you just have here a work package and a buffer in the cr uh, critical chain plan, and they just report remaining duration like, like every, other, uh, every other people. And that's it. Multi-project management, drum buffer rope, um, critical chain, of course, and ultimate and reliable Scrum as the third level in critical chain. And I really would appreciate if we change the strategy and tactic trees and include a note that means um, 
agile. Ultimate Scrum, of course. So if you put everything together, you have reliability, you are fast and agile. Indirectly, you have the maximum throughput, because if you shorten the lead time, you find all the obstacles and you get throughput. Um, you are scalable, by the way. It's best of both worlds. You have the agility, and it's called speed for projects, and that's it. Just one thing. Two minutes for questions. Just two? It's, it's half an hour, and then questions. Okay, but I have a, 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 a solution for that either. Um, I'm here. You can ask me whatever you want. And I have um, just today, a few minutes ago, a book uh, came out on LeanPub about this. It's called Tame the Flow. Um, and all the stuff is in. I wrote it together with Steve Tendon. Uh, so I have here some vouchers, 30% uh, off. It's not, not uh, expensive either. So you can talk to me and I answer questions and I provide vouchers. Until today, my idea of Scrum had everything to do with rugby. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to thank you so much for your presentation. And we have a lovely book of all the places you don't have time to go see. Oh. But I think if you get really agile, you may make it to some of them. It's Germany. Yes. I love this. <laughs> You're welcome. I've been asked to make a couple of announcements to please encourage everyone to go to the closing session today because there's uh, an exciting announcement from the Gold Rat Foundation. Um, and in addition, uh, C. Jessica or myself, we have expanded our raffle to include um, some other items, books and things, and we'll be selling those raffle tickets at lunch for five euros. So it'll be the computers plus a number of books that have been here on display. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>